Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Pian Pian. I'm the founder of Emotions. Emotions is a platform to help you increase success and happiness by developing important soft skills such as emotional intelligence, um, communication skills, and interpersonal skills. Today, we are very excited and honored to have Professor James Groves with us today. Professor James Groves is a psychology professor at Stanford. He's also an expert on emotion regulations and he has received multiple teaching awards at Stanford for both undergraduate and uh, postgraduate teaching, as well as multiple research awards from um, the different research associations. Professor Grosch, we're super happy to have you here. Um, is there anything else you would like to add um, in, tr in terms of yourself? And um, I also wanted to add, Professor Gross is also a Yale alum, and, we, we are super happy to have you here. Thank you. Pian Pian, thank you so much for um, asking me to join. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to chat with you today. Um, just a word more maybe about my background so people know where I'm coming from. Um, after studying philosophy at Yale, I went on and studied at Oxford and then did a clinical psychology degree at UC Berkeley. So my perspective, I think, starts from the idea that there's just a lot of suffering that people are experiencing in general. Sometimes that takes a form of clinical diagnoses uh, where you have anxiety disorders or uh, mood disorders, but a lot of the suffering that we face is also subclinical, um, which sounds like it's not a big deal, but it is a really big deal. And particularly during the pandemic, we've seen just escalation uh, beyond belief in anxiety and mood disorders and other uh, flavors of suffering. So I'm very attentive to that. And my students and I at Stanford have for you know, more than 25 years been working to better understand how emotions play out over time. And when emotions uh, are unhelpful, which they sometimes are, what we can do about it. And that's what I mean by emotion regulation. It's just an umbrella term for all of the processes we use to try to influence which emotions we have, when we have them, and how those emotions are experienced and expressed. I think, you know, sometimes when people hear the term emotion regulation, they may misunderstand and think, oh, well, this is clearly someone who hates emotions and thinks they should all go away. And that's not at all our perspective. We actually think that many times emotions are incredibly helpful. Even so-called negative emotions of fear, or even sometimes anger or sadness can be incredibly important and helpful to us in our lives and achieving our goals. So we're really very specifically focused on times when people make the judgment that their emotions just really are getting in the way of what they wanna be doing in their lives. And it's in those cases that we're really interested in what they try to do to manage or modify their emotions. And um, we try to use science, psychological science, to empirically derive answers to people's questions about what can they do to more effectively regulate. So I think just in summary then, although I come via philosophy, I'm very much grounded in psychology. As you said, I've been a professor at Stanford for, this is my 28th year at Stanford. And um, our focus in the lab is very much around emotions and emotion regulation. And Pian Pian, I understand that you have some questions, which I'm happy to address. I'm also, if you find it useful, happy to say just a few words about how I think about emotion regulation, what some of the distinctions that I find are useful to make. But I'm happy to have you lead off if you'd like to start, Pian Pian. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gross. Re really appreciate that you dedicate so much uh, of your research and time to research uh, emotions and emotion regulation because it's a very important aspect uh, in our lives. Um, so just curious, what's your emotional state right now? Happy. I, I love talking about this. This is my favorite topic in the entire <laughs> universe, I have to say. That's so great. anytime anytime I have an excuse to talk about my work to people who care about it, this is a good thing. So no, I'm excited. Uh, and you know, I wish obviously we were in person. That's even more fun. My favorite mode of teaching is small seminars when I'm actually in person and we can interact. But 
hey, this is second best, and I think it's a pretty good second best. So I'm excited. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. We'll try to make it uh, interactive as well. So audience, if you have questions or if you would like to just post about your emotional state, please feel free to post in the chat. Um, yeah, we would love to hear a little bit uh, more about your thoughts on what what is emotion regulation, as, as you mentioned a little bit in the introduction. And um, I'm also curious, how is emotion regulation different from suppressing emotions, for example? Yeah, happy to answer both of those things, Pan Pan. So here, here's how I think about things. Uh, and this is a, you know, a pretty simple scheme, but it's one that we found very helpful. So, so here's the idea. Um, when I started in this field some years ago, the way that people were thinking is really like a list. So they sort of wrote papers and tried to figure out what do people do when they're feeling discouraged or depressed? And it was a great big list. You know, you might talk to your mom, you might throw a pillow, you might go for a run. And there wasn't really a sense of organization or which of these many strategies that are in a big list might work. So what I did was back up a step and said, well, look, how do we think in very simple terms about emotions unfolding over time? And I'm being very generous with what I mean by emotions. So I would include stress responses and various other affective uh, states in this very broad conception of emotion for today's conversation. So how do emotions unfold? Well, let's start really simply by saying, well, usually there's some kind of situation that has cues that trigger or cause us to pay attention. So there's a situation which we then pay attention to and then think about in certain ways. And we talk about that as an appraisal, a way of thinking about what we're attending to in the situation. And it's that appraisal in our view that leads to an emotion where an emotion is just a loosely coordinated set of changes in how we feel, our expressive behavior, and our physiological response. So again, just as a really simple scheme, we're thinking that in some situations, we pay attention and then think in certain ways, and that's what gives rise to these responses. Now that's such a simple cartoon, you might think it doesn't do any work for us at all, but here's the work it does. Now that we're thinking about how emotions unfold over time, whether it's anger or happiness, sadness, disgust, all of these, I think, play out in this sequence. It's a situation we can identify, we attend to some features of it, we then think about the, the, those features, and that's what leads to the emotion. Here's the work it does for us. If we now want to ask not just how emotions play out in our lives, but what we can do to change how they play out, we can now use that simple scheme for understanding how emotions arise to say, right, we can intervene at one or more of these points in the emotion generative process to modify how the emotions play out. And concretely, we've distinguished five families of regulatory strategies, and they're just connected to different points in that emotion generative process. First step, earliest step, is what we call situation selection. This is just making decisions about what situations we expose ourselves to on the basis of how they're gonna make us respond emotionally. So if there's someone who we find really, really upsetting to deal with, and we don't wanna have that feeling of being upset, we might avoid that person. It's as simple as that. So that would be an example of situation selection. A second family of emotion regulation processes is what we call situation modification. So now you're in a situation, and is there anything you can do to influence features of that situation so that you no longer have the emotion that you want to not have? So that's situation modification. The third family of regulatory processes, just moving straight down the line, influences the attentional process. And here we're just using attentional deployment as an umbrella term for all the things we can do to shift our attention within a situation. We're not changing the situation. We're not picking a different situation. We're just shifting our attention within the situation. A fourth family of regulatory processes comes the next stage. That's where we're thinking about the situation. And by changing our thinking, that's called cognitive change, 
we can actually change the emotional impact of the situation. And that's where a lot of our work is focused because it's a very powerful leverage point. And then the fifth family of regulatory processes is sort of the end of the cycle where you actually directly modify one or more aspects of emotion. You had asked about suppression. From my perspective, suppression is a form of response modulation where you work very hard to either not feel or not show what you're feeling. So suppression has a part whole relation to the domain of emotion regulation. Emotion regulation refers to all of these processes, situation selection, situation modification, attention deployment, cognitive change, response modulation, all five of those buckets fit under emotion regulation. Whereas suppression is just an example of one of those, from one of those buckets. Pian Pian, did I put that in a clear way in response to your question? Yes, I think so. Uh, let me try to summarize in the Perfect. layman's term. So one is um, select what kind of situation you want to put yourself into. Second is to modify the situation if you can. The third is to, um, what's the third? Change your attention. Change it your attention, right? Yeah, like see what, what you focus on. And then the fourth is to uh, kind of change your thinking, how you view the situation. And then the fifth is to... Um, Directly manage the responses that are coming out of all of these processes. Right, okay, yeah, manage, manage your own responses. So yeah, this is very helpful to have the overview of what is emotion regulation, the five stages. Um, curious, like, which part of that um, do you find most effective? You mentioned the changing the thinking part is what you focus on most. And um, for example, we, we read that in uh, news articles that a lot of people under tremendous of stress and uh, pressure during the pandemic. And, and, and there's things that we can't control. In this case, like how would you suggest someone to, uh, for example, manage their stress and, um, and <laughs> we also read in the news that there are some people who are kind of blowing out at their partners or, or other people, um, colleagues or people they encounter because of the stress that they accumulated. So yeah, just curious to hear what strategies yeah. do you well, suggest? Well, great, Pam Pam. So if I could answer all of those things uh, mm -hmm. in two minutes, I should get a huge prize because those <laughs> are really hard questions. <laughs> but let me, let me have a go at this because um, I think you're asking just the right questions. So let me break it down. So the first thing I want to make sure that everyone understands is that, you know, you've got all these different possible strategies. Key idea here is that when we have emotions that we really find they're going to be unhelpful for us, there are things we can do. And that's what these buckets or strategies um, refer to. And so the key idea is that we have some control, some control over our emotions. Now it's important to say that because it turns out that people who believe that they have no control over their emotions, that emotions are kind of like weather, it just comes and goes and you have nothing to say about it. Very reasonably, those people do not spend energy trying to change their emotions. If they believe they can't, of course they don't bother trying to change them. So the key gateway uh, idea is that emotions are things that we can have some control over, not perfect control. I've never met anybody who has perfect control over his or her emotions. But people who uh, I think uh, are immersed in this literature and who practice these, these steps that we're talking about can become very, very expert at having lots of different strategies at the disposal. So that would be sort of like having a big toolkit. Imagine you're trying to fix something complicated. Our minds are incredibly complicated. And we show up with just a screwdriver to fix this very complex machine. Not going to go so well. But if you have multiple tools, the way you'd have multiple sort of experience with multiple forms of regulation, you're in much better shape. So idea number one is we can have some control over our emotions, and then we can do that by using these different tools. The second key idea is that these tools are not interchangeable. That is to say, in some situations, we don't have control. Our boss has control. We can't just walk out of the situation and go find a new boss. 
we're stuck with some of our coworkers or in a family context, we've got the family we've got and we need to work with them and not just swap them out and find somebody else. So in each of these cases, some of these forms of regulation are gonna be less relevant because some of them are not applicable. That's why it's so important to have different tools at your disposal so that you can kind of match the tool to the situation in order to maximize the chance of being in the kind of emotional state you think will be most helpful. So idea number one, emotions can be controlled to some degree. Idea number two, you can do that regulation using different strategies. Idea number three, really important idea. Based on decades of work, we now know that it's not just there are lots of strategies and just use whatever you want. Some of these strategies are generally more helpful than others. And I'll give you a specific example. I talked about cognitive change. It's also known as reappraisal. Both of those are just referring to trying to change our thinking in ways that will change our emotional responses. And that turns out to be a very, very effective strategy in many situations. Not all, and we'll come back to that if you'd like, but in many situations, developing that capacity, using that capacity can be very powerful. Another thing that people do a lot of is something you referenced, Pian Pian, which is suppression. Another go-to strategy for people, specifically a form of response modulation, is just trying not to show what you're feeling. People just use that a lot. It turns out, although it can sometimes be very important strategically to not show what you're feeling in a particular circumstance, if you do that chronically, that's not good for you. We've done study after study showing that people who tend to chronically suppress positive emotions, negative emotions, don't feel any better for doing it. They may feel worse. They are more distant from other people because other people can't read what's really going on. And cognitively, they don't function as well because they're so distracted by trying to constantly monitor their emotional expressions. What's more, physiologically, the effort associated with suppressing emotions actually leads to a magnified physiological response. And there's emerging evidence that when you do that, suppress, 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 you have all of these negative consequences and you may even have some longer term health consequences, including compromised cardiovascular functioning. So this is not you know, just a little thing, this is a big thing because the strategies we choose to use on a regular basis either set us up for some success like reappraisal or cognitive change where we can think differently, that makes us feel better, people feel closer to us, our health is better, not worse. And we contrast that to suppression, which is sort of the opposite. People don't feel as comfortable around us, we don't feel better, we're cognitively very laden and we're physically in worse shape. So I wanna be clear on this third point, that different strategies have different consequences. I'm making it sound like always use the cognitive change and never use suppression. That's not true because there are some times that using cognitive change can actually get you in trouble. I'll give you an example. Let's say you're in a really toxic relationship in your personal life. And you, each time that something flares up, you kind of make an excuse for the person who's really being toxic to you. That takes away the negative emotion. So in that sense, it's, it's successful. But do you get out of the relationship? No, because you don't have the negative emotion to kind of push you out of the relationship. So by being successful in decreasing your emotion, by thinking differently, looking on the positive side, this person may change, this is going to get better. You feel a little better, but long-term you stay stuck in that bad relationship. So that'd be an example of where cognitive change, not such a good idea. How about suppression? I've said it's pretty bad news if you do it all the time, right? But sometimes we're in an interpersonal situation, negotiation, whatever the situation is in the workplace, and we need to manage our emotions. It's not professional to burst into tears in the middle of a negotiation, in, in, at least in most cultural contexts. 
that decreases your power, changes the whole set and distracts everybody from the issues at hand. So in those cases, if you need to suppress because you can't do some other things, that would be better than not doing suppression. So Pian Pian, those are some key ideas, I think, to kind of put on the table for people that the idea that we have some control over emotions, really important. Mm -hmm. Idea number two, there are different strategies we can use. And we wanna have lots of tools when we go into these situations. Idea number three, different tools have different success rates in different situations. Mm -hmm. And so we wanna be really smart about the, the tools we're using and practice and notice what works for us and realize that this is something you can get better at over time. These so-called soft skills matter an immense amount. Do you wanna be part of a work group where the person is calm, focused, warm, appropriate? Or do you wanna be in a work group where someone's flying off the handle, stressed out, yelling at people and off topic? It's easy, you know where you wanna be. And you wanna be one of those people that others wanna be you know, on a team with. Pian Pian, those are a few thoughts and I'm happy to open it up. I know we don't have a ton of time, but I wanna make sure that if people have questions or things you'd like us to get to, that we can do that. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks everyone again for joining. Please feel free to share your thoughts or questions um, in the chat and we'll take that as we go. Um, super helpful to help, uh, to hear the few ideas they have, Treasure Growth. Curious, like, would you, Able, would you be able to summarize like the, a few tools that you that you think that are most um, helpful and uh, in most cases? And then what are kind of daily practices? You mentioned practice is important. What are the kind of daily practices you recommend that people can build up the muscles of the soft skills that when a stressful situation comes or uh, anger or sadness trigger situation comes, we are already kind of at our best to regulate our emotions? Yeah, let me take the second question first, um, because mm -hmm. it's an important one, which is sort of what can we do? What practices can we engage in to, 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 to gain experience and to gain expertise in mm -hmm. this domain? It's a really important question. And I think for many people in our culture, I mean, we don't come, most of us don't come pre-programmed with a full understanding of our emotions, right? That just doesn't happen. So for many people, um, they are just sort of figuring out who they are as an emotional being as they move, not only through childhood into adolescence, but through adulthood, right? So a lot of people are, you know, lifelong project here, figuring out what, what our emotion triggers are, what are the things that are difficult for us? You know, what are the situations that are most productive for us? What are the situations that are really horrible for us? So it's a lifelong learning process. And I think for many people who haven't had a chance to think about some of these things that we're talking about today, their emotions do feel a little bit more like stuff that's happening from the outside in, just sort of happens and they feel out of control. They, they don't really appreciate the connections between their thinking and their emotional responses. I'm simplifying, of course, people have some idea about this, but I, I think on a practical basis, people don't have a ready understanding of this. What that means is that for a lot of people, they go through a day, blow up at somebody, come home upset, yell at somebody else in their home, and then sort of don't know what to do about all, all of it. So they may have a drink or you know, disengage or, or something like that. Now, again, it's a cartoon, but I think that is kind of where most people are. And I think what we're talking about today is a way of developing even a simple framework for thinking, hey, emotions play out over time. There are ways that I can intervene to, to change them. By practicing, I can get better. I can make some distinctions between different things that I can do to regulate my emotions. Some are gonna work better, some are not gonna work as well for me. And by noticing, first of all, one's emotions, just that, noticing your emotions as you move through the day. That's a huge win right there because I think people feel buffeted by them. They're not even aware that their thinking changes and their patterns of interaction change because they're in an emotional state. So I think win number one is just notice your emotions. Then as you are attending to your emotions, either in retrospect, so you sort of at the, in your night, at the night, you sort of can think, what happened today? You can think, yeah, I was really happy about this good thing that happened at work. And then I got super stressed out about this. And, and then you can reflect in your mind's eye after it had happened, 
think, is there any other way that I could have handled that? And I think by reflecting, you can, by simulation, sort of try out, well, what if I had not said that? Okay, that probably would have gone better. Or what if I had really focused on the fact that he was trying to help me, even though that was really, I thought, a sexist uh, comment of his. Now, I'm not going to forgive the sexism, but I am going to at least notice the intent was positive. So there's something there that's positive to work with. So that'd be rethinking. So for me, it's, you know, notice your emotions, either in retrospect or in real time, and then give some thought to the strategies you might have used. And what I think we're doing as we build expertise is by noticing emotions repeatedly and trying out different strategies, either in, in imagination or in reality, we're building our repertoire and we're building our experience of what works. So I think it's this gradual process. And I think the real win here is not just noticing emotions, trying out different things imaginally, but trying them out in real life, seeing if they work. And then when you get really good at this, you can actually anticipate. We do this in other parts of life, right? For those of us who've had young kids, you know, they're hot in the morning. They can't imagine that they're gonna be cold later. But we as parents know that they need to take warm clothing because they're going on a school outing and they're gonna be freezing. So in a similar sense, we can do that for ourselves and our loved ones by sort of gaining some wisdom about what the emotional trajectory of our day or week or month is gonna be. And slowly, as we gain an expertise, we can then anticipate and then start to use some of those situational strategies that are very, very powerful yeah. by sculpting our lives in a way that leads us to have opportunities to have the kinds of emotions we don't, uh, we want to have and not the ones we don't. I see that James uh, has a quick question, which I thought I'd jump to if that's okay, PNPN. Pian, of course, you. yes, thank you. So practical tips in deploying cognitive reappraisal um, particularly since our stress hormones usually outperform anything else. This is a great point, James. So in the moment, this is why I'm continually emphasizing practice and noticing your emotions and sort of trying out different things and anticipation. It's absolutely true. As James is saying, in the moment, particularly if it's a really high stress situation, even a pretty strong experts not going to be able to dynamically engage prefrontal cortex, which is required for modifying meaning structure of a situation. In English, we get overwhelmed and we can't think differently. So what we need to do is one of a couple things. One, in the moment, and it's as old as can be, take a breath, go to the bathroom and just take a time out, anything you need to do for a respite so you can calm down because what you wanna do is you wanna distract, shift your attention away from what's freaking you out or making you super stressed. Give yourself that space because it's only after you've had that space you can calm down enough that you can actually creatively rethink the situation. So that's option one. Give yourself a breather, use that breather to calm down, then rethink. Option number two is anticipate that you're gonna deal with, let's say a boss or coworker who's really always just presses your buttons and preset your thinking in a way sort of in advance, you're sort of setting up an appraisal that you think is going to make you more resilient in that context. So James, that's my best go with that. And Pian Pian, I see we're at four and I know we need to stop, but I want to um, thank you for the invitation. This has been a pleasure to chat with you uh, and folks on the call. And um, hopefully this is a tiny bit useful for everyone. Good luck in your emotion regulation quest, everybody. Uh, and um, you know, we have zillions of papers, uh, obviously, on our website. If any of those are of interest, just Google me and you'll see them on the Stanford website. But with that, I'll stop. And thank you so much, Pian Pian, for inviting me on board. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gross, to share your expertise and knowledge with us. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, we'll share the recording afterward as well. And uh, thanks again for, for uh, gener generously sharing your time. It's my pleasure. Okay, be well, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.